Listening to Better Known, where each episode a guest makes a series of recommendations of things which they think should be better known. Our recommendations include interesting people, places, objects, stories, experiences, and ideas which our guest feels haven't had the exposure that they deserve. The only conditions for discussion are that our guest loves it and thinks it merits your attention as well. My name's Ivan Wise, and this week's guest on Better Known is Elizabeth Kendall. So you're a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies, and you're shortly to take up a new role as mistress of Girton College in Cambridge. It's the sort of job that you might imagine involves a slightly unconventional interview. Were there any questions that particularly stood out for you? Gosh, well, that would be giving the game away, wouldn't it? (laughs) But maybe the question that was funniest was, how do you feel about being called mistress? Uh, and I hadn't expected them to ask that, but of course it's a good question. It's a slightly unusual job title and, and comes with all sorts of connotations, but the college feels pretty strongly about the title mistress because it was when it was founded an all female college founded in the 1860s and it's always had a mistress. And so even had they appointed a man and men were uh, shortlisted for this, I believe, they would also have been asked to adopt the role mistress. So you've chosen six things to discuss. Your first choice is craft chocolate. So most people who are considering buying a bar of chocolate are gonna look no further than the dairy milk or Mars. Why should they be trying craft chocolate instead? That's an excellent question. So I've always been a sucker in the past for a dairy milk But I think once you've tasted the real stuff, it's quite hard to go back. So reason number one, why would you have craft chocolate? It tastes absolutely fantastic. There's so much to savour. There's all sorts of tastes to untangle. What do I mean by craft chocolate? It's not mass produced. Craft chocolate is the kind of chocolate that's produced in small batches and where you know the beans gone into the chocolate. You know the provenance of the beans. Craft chocolate actually savours those kinds of variations. And the craft makers take great care to make each step of their making process fried and tested so that they can bring out the flavours. And there's a lot that goes into making craft chocolate. You have to harvest it with care. You have to ferment the cocoa pods. You have to dry it, roast it, grind it, conch it. Conching is is a kind of fine grinding. And then you temper it, mould it. And, uh, and then finally, you, you package it. So that's why you like it. How did you get into it? How did you discover craft chocolate? Well, I discovered it through my partner, Simon, and his business partner, a guy called Spencer, who they started a company called Coco Runners. And I was instrumental in helping them taste over 4,000 <laughs> bars of chocolate. Well done. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a tough ask. But I also loved the packaging. Some of it comes so artistically packaged and I've collected and saved all the wonderful, coloured, beautiful, artistic wrappers. And one day I'm just going to wallpaper my office in it. And I came across one, I don't know much about craft shop, but I came across one brand. There's a village in Wiltshire called Laycock that apparently is quite popular. Have you come across that one? Actually, I I haven't come across Laycock, but I'm, I'm pretty fussy about whether chocolate makers directly from the bean to the bar or whether they're just buying chocolate in large vats okay. of molten chocolate and then they mould it into something better. Now, I'm not sure about Laycock, but there are some great British chocolate makers. There's Duffy's, which uh, is based in Grimsby, which you don't normally associate with craft chocolate, perhaps. Is there but fish really in it? Or? No, there's no fish in it. But uh, this guy who started it up, he actually had a career in motorsport. And uh, and so he sort of brings a very scientific take to making his chocolate uh, He actually won a Golden Bean Award. Have you attempted to um, use this craft chocolate to cook with as well? Is it just for eating the bar? I haven't attempted to cook with it. Uh, It's very expensive, but I'm I'm sure you could. It's just I'm really not very good at cooking. If I were, I'd probably want, I'd probably go for beans from Papua New Guinea, I think, because they've got a a lovely smoky barbecue flavour. You know, you can really tell where a chocolate bean comes from, from from the taste. So I also like Madagascan bars. They're very citrusy. So it's a bit, it is a bit like wine in that sense. And do you think you could persuade as your first act 
the cafe at Girton College to stock some of it. I'm sure I could. Actually, I think they might already have some original beans uh, <laughs> brand chocolate in there. I, I'll have to go and check that out. But uh, I did notice they had some decent chocolate in the Girton Cafe. So, so all is not lost. So craft chocolate should be better known. <laughs> Your second choice is the war in Yemen, which began in 2014, but has unfortunately remained an issue that most people in Britain, at least, are only very dimly aware of. You've had a connection with Yemen for a number of years and have worked with the office of the UN envoy to Yemen. But when did you first go and visit the country? Gosh, I first visited Yemen just over a decade ago. I I went to Sana'a, the capital, during the the revolution, the uprising. That was a real eye-opening visit. It was it was a sort of strange, almost party atmosphere. And, and lots of tents where all the different groups and political currents would hang out. It almost, in a, in a, in a way, reminded me of Life of Brian, you know, where you have all those different groups. And I went back again during the National Dialogue a, a year or so later to the capital. That was an interesting experience, too, because, of course, the, the international community was so keen on this national dialogue and lauding it up as a, as a wonderful model for the post-Arab spring. Yet, talking to people on the ground, they were a lot less sure. And I remember going around with uh, some uh, guys from the eastern tribes who were keeping me safe. And yeah, every time we heard gunfire, which isn't that unusual, then they would uh, you know, they would fall about laughing, just saying, oh, here we are, it's the national dialogue. Because for everyone there tended to think that there was a war in waiting um, and it was just going to be a question of time. And indeed, sadly, they were right. And so the war there's been going on for eight years. It's very complicated, like all wars can be. It seems like it started out as a sectarian war between Sunni and Shiite. Briefly, can you explain kind of What have the ongoing causes been? Why has it continued for so long? It didn't really start as a sectarian war between Sunnis and Shiites, but it it has become a reality. It was always talked about in those terms, and now those terms tend to be more correct than they were at the beginning of the war. So, you know, this is, in a sense, a proxy war with Saudi Arabia and Iran thrashing it out on Yemeni territory as a massive simplification, but... Yeah, essentially, that that is partly true. Uh, And the reason it carries on so long is none of the root causes are being addressed. I mean, there is an uneasy truce at the moment. There has been a a kind of ceasefire of sorts since April, but it's really fragile. And unless it causes the marginalisation, the corrupt government the need to be much more inclusive in representation. There are so many problems. Unless all of that happens, it's not really going to end. One of the real problems is the loss of an entire generation. Actually, in the northern areas of Yemen, where the Houthis, the so-called rebels, come from, originate from, there's really been on and off war now since 2004. If you're a a young man of, of... 23 you really only can remember war so this is now about not logic it's about cycles of revenge it's about honor it's just a way of life war is a way of life so I'm not very hopeful it's often described as the world's worst humanitarian crisis from a simple point of view of people not having access to regular food or health care Western powers have attempted to intervene with kind of limited or negligible success And it sounds like it's a conflict that hasn't had the publicity that it deserves. What more should have been done or should be done to try and bring it to more people's attention, do you think? Yeah, that's right. It hasn't had that much attention. But it is important because it sits in a really important geostrategic position. It guards the opening to the Red Sea through the uh, Bab al-Mandab Strait. So it's very important for shipping. It's important for international trade. It sits right next to our allies, Saudi Arabia and Oman. And and the last thing we want is this very populous state uh, imploding completely or spilling over further into the region. But if we're not seeing Yemeni refugees wash up on the cliffs of Dover, it's not really in in our minds. But that's not to say that there aren't refugees. There are, but they're inside Yemen itself. There are about four million displaced Yemenis inside Yemen. 
And, and the crisis goes on. There are about 400,000 people have died so far as a result of this conflict, if you include indirect deaths from uh, starvation or, or cholera. It's, it's absolutely appalling. And about 80% of the 30 million population need some kind of, of aid. So it really needs to be on our radars. And actually, there's one other thing that I, I really ought to mention, which is that there's an oil tanker sitting off the coast of Yemen called the Safir oil tanker, which has got about a million barrels of oil on board, which are about to potentially spill into the Red Sea. These are sitting in, in rebel waters. This, so this is quite difficult to access. And, and there is a UN appeal out there to try and get this oil off the ship. It's a very expensive operation. And there's still $20 million short of phase one. But you know, unless that's done soon, we could have a massive disaster on our hands. And the estimate is, is that it would cost up to about $20 billion to clean up. So actually, that's certainly something that ought to be better known. How long has it been there for? Oh, it's been there for years and years. It's been <laughs> moored there. But normally, it would undergo a regular maintenance schedule. But since the war began in 2014 and the international war in 2015, it hasn't been maintained. And so it's rusting away and it's not being patched up. So it, there's an imminent danger there. All right. So the war in Yemen should be better known. Your third choice is a series of audio lectures called The Great Courses, which covers a whole range of subjects from the philosophy of humour, the decisive battles of world history and behavioural economics. So how did you first come across this resource? I love listening to things all the time, podcasts, audiobooks. Uh, I like to use every single minute, every single minute counts. So anything I do, whether I'm, I don't know, watering my plants, emptying the dishwasher, running to the shop for a pint of milk, <laughs> I've nearly always got my headphones on and I'm listening to something. I came across these courses on the Audible app the great courses. And I just think they're wonderful because anything you want to know about, there are over 500 of these courses. Uh, you know, you can just get a university education on it pretty quickly, uh, a, a fairly basic university education, but nonetheless, so that come out in 30 minute chunks are a brilliant way of getting to grips with subjects that you've always wanted to know about. You just mentioned philosophy, but you know, I've, there are tons of these I've listened to now, especially if you think there are gaps in your education. And, you know, I went through a state school education and I felt that there were maybe a few gaps in it. So I've, I've listened to all sorts of things from um, figuring out how volcanoes or earthquakes or climate change happens. Music is a mirror of history. That was really good. Talking about music in its historical setting. So what does that tell us about the music? Uh, what, one example would be, that just springs to mind, Wagner's Ring Cycle. You know, it's not just about Nordic sagas. It's, it's actually a reflection of 19th century European society and the greed and corruption and, and maybe a bit, bit of hope that was there. Also really enjoyed Masters of War. Yeah, learning about Machiavelli, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, Jomini. You know, th these are just things that I wouldn't really get the opportunity to, to hear lectures on normally. And, and the, the other thing I love about these audible lectures is that they're designed to be spoken. So it's not like listening to an audio book, especially nonfiction, where you have to concentrate quite hard. You know, it doesn't matter if you're in the supermarket reading a label and you miss 30 seconds or you tune out because you're crossing the road, you can just pick it up again. Uh, it's just wonderful. And I guess it's true for many of us as we go through adult life, we become more and more specialist about what we're looking at. And maybe particularly for those uh, working in academia, you're, you're kind of specialising all the time. So it's quite easy. You can neglect some of the more general areas and think, actually, wait a minute, I don't know as much about that as I should do. That's exactly right. We specialise really early in the UK. Uh, actually, I guess at, at age 16, when we pick our A-levels. So you wouldn't normally take a science course if you're studying languages and, and this really gives you the opportunity to branch out try a few things that perhaps you, you've not had the chance to do before and of course this form of learning for some people makes up for the absence of a university education but others in the day and age of high tuition fees and so forth may choose to learn through this route instead so for traditional universities like the ones that you work within what can they learn from this form of teaching what can they use from it to adapt their own styles of learning do you think 
oh gosh oh you're implying I'm just doing myself out of a job by uh, <laughs> by advertising this wonderful <laughs> this wonderful institution of the great courses now I think there's a lot more to university than just picking up knowledge uh, of course that's incredibly important that's our, our bread and butter teaching knowledge but then there's what do you do with that knowledge and how do you really learn it's about discussing it it's about turning that knowledge over in your head with others it's about challenging yourself and challenging others it's about having a view on something and it's about deciding on your sources is this correct isn't it it's not really just two-dimensional get some facts in your brain so whilst the courses are good at that they're, they're not necessarily good at the other bits but hopefully this these sorts of uh, resources while they're certainly complementary to university education, might end up driving up standards everywhere because there's a bit more competition. Yes, maybe. And and one of the things that that really strikes me about these courses is that they are very professional. They're well thought through, they're well planned, they're well articulated. Uh, You get course notes with them as well. And frankly, I'm certainly not going to mention any university names here, and I've worked at a few places, so the door's wide open. But it's not always like that in a university setting. The teaching's not always that well constructed, shall we say. So, yeah, there, there, there are definitely areas that, that can be improved in a traditional university education along the lines of, of these courses. All right. So the great courses should be better known. You're listening to Better Known with my guest today, Elizabeth Kendall, who's been choosing a series of things which she thinks should be better known. So far, we've had craft chocolate, the war in Yemen and the great courses. So we've talked very positively so far, but as well as things which should be better known, is there anything really famous that you wish was much less well known? Yes, the speaker button on a mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is I don't know if anybody else out there is noticing it, but it's so common now for people to walk around with their phone on the loudspeaker. So you're not just hearing them bellowing down the phone, but someone bellowing back as well. And it just creates a whole load of unnecessary noise. I was in the doctor's surgery the other day, waiting, packed waiting room, with several people just chatting on their phones with the phone chatting back to them. Now, I guess you could argue that, oh, it's just like having a friend next to you. But it's not really, because in in real life, you temper your conversation to the environment and and authentic noise that's made by speech in in an interactive environment, by movement or by action. That's that's dynamic. It's different. It's different from this machine generated stuff. And the thing that annoys me most is people actually watching videos out loud on their phones. You know, what's wrong with using headphones? (laughs) So, I mean, you're, you're not I, listening to the great courses with loudspeaker on, I'm assuming. I'm certainly not, although, uh, you know, people might appreciate that a bit more. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, no, no, I'm a big fan of, of whatever you're doing. You know, that's your business. But uh, please don't make it mine. OK, well, we'll try and avoid the speaker button if we possibly can. Your fourth <laughs> choice is the Lycian Way, a walk in Turkey, a country you know well. So why do you think the Lycian Way should be better known? The Lycian Way should be better known because it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. It's spread out, yes, over 300 miles on this gorgeous Turkish coastline. You don't have to do too much planning because there aren't that many people who are, who are walking it. It's a little bit more disorganised, so it's a bit more exciting. You have to find the little flags. You know, it's a bit harder than it, than it would be, say, in, in the Alps or one of the big GR routes across Europe. I guess it's also being in a culture that is so vibrantly hospitable and and the food's wonderful lots of fishing villages you can pass through um so very wholesome food so it's 300 miles as you said across southern turkey how long does it take to complete well it normally takes about a month to complete i've got to be honest with you i have not done the whole route i only did about 120 kilometers of it and uh, i did that in a week and i also i started the other way around so it runs from a place called Fethiye in, in the west to Antalya, which is in the, the Konya Alta region in the east. Uh, and so I started in the east and it was much, much more wild, I think, than had you started on, on, on the west bit near Fethiye, which is a very popular resort. 
going backwards was it was a bit challenging because you really had to look out for the way markings, which are mostly for the other direction. And, uh, and I, I didn't see a soul for about four days. I went out of season in March, but it was really quite, well, quite exciting and climbed up to Mount Olympus. There was snow, <laughs> got followed by wild dogs. And I ended up just knocking on people's you know, village houses and asking for places to stay because it was so out of season. But that was quite exciting too. All sorts of things happen when you when you don't plan. And the route itself is relatively recently created, but it's lots of old footpaths, is that right? Yeah, that's right. The the route, I think, was created about 20 years ago, but it, it's it's ancient, yes. Goes, so Lycia, well, I guess Lycia goes back to the, the Bronze Age, and, and, and apparently this route was, it was created by, by an English woman called Kate Clo, and uh, or created, it was marked by her. Some of the footpaths probably do go back to the Bronze Age when it was used as a, as a mule trail. Some of the paths are you know, littered with sarcophagi and there are rock cut tombs. It's terribly interesting uh, and, and some beautiful places to see. All right, so the Lycian Way should be better known. Your fifth choice is Elizabeth Welsh who in 1885 took up the role of mistress of Girton College in Cambridge, the role that you're shortly due to take up. So Elizabeth Welsh was born in Ireland in 1843. How did she end up in Cambridge? Well, I should immediately fess up to the fact that it is the current mistress of Girton College, Professor uh, Susan Smith, who put me onto this character, Elizabeth <laughs> Welsh. And I was completely intrigued. Actually, I found out uh, that she was she actually died 50 years before I was born, 50 years exactly to the very day. Oh, right. So I thought I'd find out a bit more about her. Luckily, she had been taught Latin and Greek by a local church minister, and, and she was lucky enough to go to boarding school in Belfast, found out about how to get a scholarship to this amazing new college, and went off to London to take the exam. She won the scholarship and read classics at Girton College and sat the exams and got a degree in 1875. So, well, actually, I say she got a degree. Actually, I should say she didn't actually get the degree. Women weren't allowed to. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, women weren't actually awarded the degrees in those days, but she did the exams and passed them and, you know, did well. How did she go from being a student there to 12 or 13 years later actually running the place? Well, she was a teacher for a while at Manchester High School, and then she came back. She was invited back as a classics lecturer. And she went down well. She was popular. She, she wrote poems. She wrote songs. She hosted dances. She was witty, funny. Although she always looked so austere in those faded old black and white photos. You know, you know they're always so highly poised. Uh, I guess no one ever smiled in those photos and probably <laughs> wouldn't because the clothes look so uncomfortable. But, you know, she, she made a reputation for herself for all sorts of things, not just teaching and writing. She was really into gardening. And, and she got really into landscaping. She planted an orchard, vegetable garden. Uh, so she was a really amazing mix of, of the practical and the intellectual. Uh, I think one of the things that struck me most about her was she had this idea of putting together a women's fire brigade. Very sensible, you know, build deep in the pond in, in the college grounds, showing good foresight. If there's a fire, we can, you know, haul out the water and put, put it out. So... Yeah, I, I guess, uh, I guess she went down well, and eventually was appointed mistress and carried on her fabulous works. So she, she ended up being at Girton for over, for over thirty years, all in all. Were the developments she brought in, new buildings and so forth, that are still there today? Yes, she did a brilliant job of expanding the college. I think it was under her that the chapel was instated as well. She uh, oversaw the purchase of more land. Uh, actually student numbers doubled under her. Uh, one thing maybe to, to mention is that she was mistress at the time when uh, the little known Cambridge protests happened. This was in 1897 when hundreds of mainly men uh, rioted in the streets of, of Cambridge. Uh, when, this was at the point when the Cambridge authorities, as the Senate was, was deciding whether to give women degrees formally and uh you know this is hugely controversial in fact the motion was defeated by a huge majority and, and there were these very ugly scenes of protests so she uh, presided over all of that effigies of women were burnt and one of 
the effigies were said to have been Elizabeth Welsh, the mistress of Girton College. So she obviously was a tough cookie. So yeah, I'd love to have known her. She sounds funny, kind, far-sighted, bags of initiative, very hardworking, through great parties, you know, what's not to like? I just wish we knew more about her. I think there's a lesson there for us all. Let's keep a diary. <laughs> yeah, is there a biography of her, do you know? Well, there are lots of sort of mini biographies of her. There's one on the Girton College website, but we don't have a lot of her, her private papers. Um, I'm not sure she I'm not sure she really wrote up her, her notes. We've got some letters and some secondhand information and, and notes, but but nothing substantial. So I think it's quite important to to keep a diary. I, I keep one myself. I don't know if anyone's going to be interested in it one day, but you know, <laughs> one day, maybe. <laughs> All right, so Elizabeth Welsh should be better known. Your final choice is foreign languages. I think you speak a number of foreign languages, including Arabic, Turkish and German. You've used your own languages in perhaps in quite unusual ways, including <laughs> discovering how militant jihad groups use poetry and music to recruit and build tolerance. So how did you discover this? I was director of a centre, a, a government-sponsored centre, for the production of Arabic language expertise to help with research. And one of our research themes was jihad and martyrdom. And I noticed that for all the Arabic I was reading, all the jihadist materials, there was tons and tons of poetry in it, but nobody was looking at it because it just didn't seem important. We tended to focus on questions like, where are the extremists? How many weapons do they have? What are they planning? Rather than questions like, what are they thinking and how do they feel and how do they communicate amongst themselves? And so, you know, you don't normally think of hardened terrorists composing poetry, but, but they were doing it. I actually did a, a little quantifying survey where I discovered that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which was the most active branch of Al-Qaeda, uh, in its, in its uh, media output, about 20% of it contained poetry, which is a huge amount. Why are they producing poetry? Not all of it's uh, waxing lyrical about sunsets over the desert. There is a pick up your gun and kill the Americans bits to it as well. So I'm certainly, you know, I'm certainly not going to gloss over that. But uh, it's fascinating stuff. And I suppose all politics is about hard power and soft power. And even political regimes that we regard as very violent also need to use other forms of connecting with people. Yes, that's right. And what we also have to remember is that connecting with people it sounds obvious, but it works differently in different cultures. So when I went to the east of Yemen to do a survey in the regions uh, bordering the Al-Qaeda state, I, I, in a rather hair-raising bit of fieldwork, I, I, you know, I asked over 2,000 tribesmen and, and, and tribeswomen their, their opinions on a whole bunch of things, social and political aspirations, etc. And one of my questions was, how important is poetry in your daily life? An amazing 74% said it was either important or very important. And that was on a scale of six. So, you know, there were lots of other answers they could have given. That totally explains why Al-Qaeda was using poetry as well as a recruitment tool. I do wonder what proportion of British people would answer yes to that question. Well, yes, that's true. That's true. But in the, you know, in the Arab world, it's, uh, it's not considered elitist. Whilst we have in the West, programs like Pop Idol or Britain's Got Talent. In Arabic, they have sort of million dollar poets or you know, they have the, the kind of poetry idol. Well, I'd love to see that on TV here as well. <laughs> I'm not sure it would get the same viewing figures as something like Strictly Come Dancing, but hey, you know, each to his own. And ultimately, your knowledge of foreign languages then has just opened up worlds to you that you simply wouldn't have been able to access without that knowledge. Yes, exactly. and. Nowhere more so than, than probably my travels in the east of Yemen when I've been trying to work on gathering research material on uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Being able to speak to people without the filter of translators, being able to interact on, on all sorts of everyday issues, sit around the campfire, chat, that kind of thing. Get, get some respect by having bothered to learn the language and know a bit about their culture. It just reaps enormous benefits. So that's the final item on the list. <laughs> so today we've had Kraft Chocolate, The War in Yemen, The Great Courses, The Lycian Way, Elizabeth Welsh and Foreign Languages. So out of your six choices, Elizabeth, which one do you feel most strongly should be better known? 
I think it has to be the Yemen war, sadly, and this very imminent problem of the surfer oil tanker. This is an imminent catastrophe. And for the sake, especially of the oil tanker, of spending $20 million finally now to get over the hurdle to do phase one of rescuing this stuff, why wouldn't we do that to, to avoid the, the environmental disaster and the 20 billion cleanup? Thank you very much to Elizabeth Kendall for her choices. We'll post links to all the topics discussed so you can decide for yourself whether they should indeed be better known. You can find all our previous episodes and subscribe to the podcast at betterknown.co.uk. My name is Ivan Wise. We look forward to talking to you again for the next episode of Better Known. Thank you.